I'm exhausted. A lot of people wonder why it is I do this exercise plan every day, so I do a full body workout four times a week, I do accessory work a few days a week, I run home almost every day. If I don't run from my store home in a regular pace, maybe sometimes I'll take the train over to the Brooklyn side and then I'll run from the top of Brooklyn to where I live in the middle of Brooklyn at a faster pace. I make sure to do that at least four times a week. And today, I don't know why. It just felt like a much longer distance than it usually is. And the people wonder about this whole vegan diet thing as well. And it's like, my grandpa on my dad's side was in shape and died of a heart attack. My grandpa on my mom's side was 59 years old when he died of a heart attack. My uncle had a heart attack somewhere in his late 40s and he had a bunch of other issues and he now has a stent and it's like, yeah. I'm 27, that's not that far away. So I do what I can now because my job is to sit and in, in literally to look into a microscope until I'm too tired to continue looking into a microscope. So I don't usually decide that something's not fixable or that I'm done for, you know, at, uh, for logical reasons. It's just, I see two of something, I look up out of the microscope, and then I see two of my receptionist. And once I look up out of the microscope and I see two of my receptionists, then I'm pretty sure that I'm only paying for one of them to be here, then I go home. So I've been trying to keep up a little bit more of my exercise than I have been. I let a lot of my exercise routine go around 2014 when I started getting deeper into this whole recording motherboard repair rabbit hole. But anyway, on to the topic of the video that I want to do today, which is going to be on discipline. A lot of parents, and I catch a lot of people that are not even parents saying this, they, a lot of people like to say these statements that just allow them to generically feel good, you know? These feel-good statements that everybody can get behind, that everybody, regardless of their political beliefs or religious beliefs or religions, can agree with. You know, this kind of stuff like, um, oh, when I was a kid, I used to get my ass kicked. Kids these days have it too easy, there's not enough discipline, and that's why society is where it is. Society is where it is because kids aren't hit enough, because we can't hit our children, because people don't punish their children. If people punish their children, we wouldn't have a national debt. If people punish their children, we wouldn't be going to war for no reason. Lack of discipline is the problem. And then everybody starts to go around and go into this whole circle jerk about how their childhood was the hardest childhood. Everybody goes into some bullshit circle jerk on how badly they had it when they were a kid. And how badly they were punished when they were a kid. And I've always found this to be the biggest bunch of crap. And it happened again today, which is why I'm bringing it up in a YouTube video. And I just... I did, I, you know, when it was time for me to, like, go, Yeah, I agree. When I was a kid, well... I didn't get punished, so I didn't make anything up. Anyway, so I want to talk about this because I believe that there is this, this asinine concept that if you want somebody to grow up to be a positive and productive member of society, that you need to take away their phone and Game Boy and beat the crap out of them when they're a kid every time they do something wrong. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why it is this doesn't work. So let's think of a lot of ways that you can punish a child. You can say that they can't go out past 5.30. They have to come home at 5.30. You can tell them that you're taking away their cell phone or their Game Boy. And it's probably obvious that I'm old at this point because I keep making reference to a Game Boy. You could tell the kid that they have to eat peas and corn and cabbage every meal for a week with no dessert. You could tell them that instead of doing their regular homework, that they have to do their regular homework plus the next lesson plan in the book every single day. What do all of these have in common? All of these punishments, including physically reprimanding the kid, have in common that they won't exist when the kid turns 18. Once he turns 18, or once she turns 18, and they're able to leave, and they're able to go out on their own, you're not going to be there to take away their Game Boy. You're not going to be there to take away their cell phone. You're not going to be there to say that they got to be home by 8.30. And you're not going to be there to give them more homework and crappy food to eat. That's not how it works. Please do not unplug my microphone. You can unplug anything you want. You can unplug the smoke detector. Just don't unplug the microphone. Good kitty. Good kitty. Come here. Clinton. Clinton. Oh, that's a berry. Come here, berry. You want attention? 
You want attention, girl? You want to be on the YouTube? Come here, Barry. Be on the YouTube. Mm. Mm. Good girl. Hi. Who's a good kitty? Don't nuzzle the microphone, girl. It's three hundred dollars. Oh, bite the microphone! Great. I say, don't nuzzle it, so you bite it. Should should I be editing this out of the video? <laughs> Come on, girl. Okay. We've had enough, come on. Come on, jump off. Good girl. And don't bite the microphone, okay? Don't bite it. Good girl. What all of these punishment types have in common is that when the kid turns 18 and moves away, cat hair, <laughs> is that you're not, they're, they're not gonna be relevant punishments anymore. Because you're not gonna be there to punish your kid. You're not gonna be there to smack them when they're 27. You're not gonna be there to take away their Game Boy when they're 48. You're not gonna be there to give them cabbage and peas and carrots for dinner every night of the week when they're 56. They are going to have to come to the conclusion themselves as to how they're going to act. So my dad never punished me. I remember when I was two or three years old, I did some bullshit that I shouldn't have done, and I got spanked. But that was when I was like two and a half, two, year, you know, two years old. After that, he tried a different approach with me. And this approach worked very well. And it is what I feel, it's what, I feel it was the catalyst for the analytical thinking mindset that I have today that I use to try to solve problems and learn how the world works. So he used to have this room in our little house. It was a very small room called the library. And it had about four bookshelves in it and had a chair. He would call that chair the thinking chair. If I did something very wrong, he would say, Lewis, go to the thinking chair. And he would say it with a level of authority in his voice that made it obvious that I need to stop what I'm doing and go to the thinking chair. And I would sit in this thinking chair for 10 or 15 minutes, and then he would show up, and he wouldn't say that I'm grounded. He wouldn't say he's taking away my stuff or any of that crap. What my dad would do is he would then start asking me questions about why I did what I did. He would ask me for the motivation behind why I did what I did. And he would just kind of go through everything and try to figure out, you know, what caused me to want to do this. And instead of telling me that it's wrong, he would do what any good therapist does and ask you questions that get you to figure out for yourself what it is that you're, why you're doing what you're doing and what it is you want. And then once he figured out what my motivation was, once he finally got back to the motivation part, by then... I would usually realize why what I did was wrong. But if I didn't, what he would do is then he would do something that most parents don't do. Whether I was four years old or 14, or even now at 27, he would talk to me like I was an adult. He would treat me like an adult. And what he would do is he would tell me a story, uh, something that went on in one of his ex-marriages or one of his you know, old jobs or with his friends from high school or college. He would tell me some story in his life. And I would have no idea why he's telling me the story because it would have nothing to do with what I did. But I would follow along because he was taking the time to tell me a personal story. He wasn't making the story up. It wasn't bullshit. It wasn't just some, you know, I'm right, you're wrong crap. He was trying to relate to me, so I would listen. He would tell me the story, and at the end of it, then he, would add, he would tell me what his motivation was for his actions. And then he would tell me what the, what the actual end result was. And I would listen. And then he would ask me what, he th what I thought he could have done differently, what I thought he could have done better. And what he's doing there in a very intelligent way is he's getting me to build the vision in my own mind as to why it is that my motivations for my actions and my actions were bullshit. And this worked very, very well. I want you to go back to those salesmanship videos that I did that nobody ever watched because I fucked up and didn't hit facial focus on the camera, so it was out of focus. But if you go back to those salesmanship videos that I did a long time ago that had some decent content that nobody's ever going to watch, I talk a lot about building vision, and I talk about how if you want to try and sell somebody on something, you can't shove the vision into their head. That doesn't work. What you have to do is you have to... What? 
Don't unplug the microphone. Barry? Come here. All I have to do is start petting an imaginary kitty in the air, and she will come running. It doesn't matter what she's doing if she thinks I'm petting another kitty. Oh, we cannot have anybody petting another kitty. Look, there's an air kitty. Good girl. Good girl. Who doesn't unplug the microphone? Now I lost my track. Cat's man. Hi. We were talking about... This is definitely not a board repair video. I'm in my apartment. Not a game video I don't see Dota on. Ah, the parenting shit. Where was I in the parenting thing video, though? Will you remind me where I was? Ah, the building vision part. So, you can't try to do this hard sale bullshit where what you do is you say, like a car, you know, like a, like a sleazy car salesman, you're like, but this car is better gas mileage than yours. But you can afford it because you can afford the gas for your present car. So if you could just calculate how much extra money you're spending on gas for your car and put it towards buying this car, you'd actually save. Oh, and look at the other features this has. You say you like music, right? Look at the nice speakers this has. And now you have to buy it. Well, you, just, you know that stupid salesmanship? I have cat hair on my face. Ah! You know, that's the, the car sale, that sleazy car salesman bullshit where they just keep beating the point home. They keep beating the point home and they keep trying to explain to you all the reasons why their idea is good, why their product is good. What they're doing is they're trying to build their vision in your head. That doesn't work. You can't shove your vision into somebody else's head. If you want your vision to appear in somebody else's head, that person has to create it for themselves. And I talk about how you're supposed to tell people no, how you're supposed to ask them questions that then get them to build up their own vision in their head as to why they want their product. I often will tell somebody why it is they shouldn't buy something, why it is they shouldn't spend money with me, and why they should do something else. Because what happens? In their head, they're like, well, I wanted to do that, but I can't because. And what they're doing is they're now building vision in their head as to why they want my product. So at the end of it, I could be half asleep, I could not be a people person, I could, I could honestly be a complete asshole and still take their money because they have a vision in their head that I have allowed them to build that explains to them why it is they want to spend money with me. And the same thing works with a kid. You can't say, you're not supposed to do this. Why not? Because! Because I'm the parent and you're the kid and you do what I say. That shit doesn't work. What you need to do is have the child have the vision built in their head by them. And that's hard. It's easy to smack the kid. It's easy to take away the kid's Game Boy. It's easy to do all this shit, but you're not building any vision in their head that's actually going to last when they turn 18 and they go out in the real world for themselves. So what my dad did was he would build vision. He would ask me what my motivations were. He would ask me why I was doing what I was doing. And at the end of it, he would tell a story if I didn't get it. And at the end of that story, you would get to see how he, the, he had the same motivation for whatever bullshit he did that I had for my actions. And he would ask me what I could have done differently. He would ask me what I would have done better if I was in his situation. And when he's doing that, I'm forced to think about why he did something wrong. I'm forced to think about what I would have done better in his shoes. And I can only naturally then start to apply that to whatever it is I just did. And it was a really great way to grow up. Because the other thing that was great about this was mutual respect. He treated me like an adult. And I know this sounds silly. I know it sounds silly, the idea of treating your six-year-old like an adult. But what you will find is that most six-year-olds, they're not that far off from adults. They may be small. They may be ignorant. They may say silly shit. And, but, but ultimately, I remember what it was like to be six. It wasn't very different than what it's like to be alive right now. Again, I was shorter. I knew a lot less stuff. 
and I, you know, I talked funny, and nobody took me seriously, but for the most part, I was still me. And if you talk to me like an adult, and you talk to me like a grown-up, and you expect a maturity out of me, most of the time you would get that maturity back. And by doing that, he actually did get maturity back, and he encouraged me to have an analytical thinking mindset from a young age. And that's something that I took with me my entire life. Because again, I was, when I turned 18, you know, when, it, when, it, when I was thinking about should I cheat at work or should I do this this way, even though it's going to take me longer to be successful, I wasn't thinking about whether he was there to take my PlayStation away. I was thinking about every single one of the stories he told me and every single one of the feelings he had at the end of the story and every single one of the consequences at the end of the story. I was thinking about the real world negative repercussions rather than the fabricated repercussions. And that's what I'm really getting to here. When you start doing that bullshit, uh, you know, that, that whole, uh, hey, what the hell was I talking about? You are so not helpful. I was, this was parenting video, and we were up to pass the bar part, pass the function bar. This is really starting to get annoying. I miss my memory. Hmm. Ah, the whole negative repercussion thing. Uh, you want the negative reinforcement to be something that is real because that's what's actually going to last, not the fabricated one. So all of the negative reinforcement I had in my head for, for immature action or for actions that were not thought through on my part were real. They were actual real world things. They weren't things that are just gonna magically disappear when I turn 18. And this is something that you see a lot in a neighborhood like mine in the East Village of Manhattan. So in the East Village, you have all of these colleges, like you know, NYU, the new school that have all their dorms there, and there are all these kids that go there for the first time. Also in the East Village, you have all of these bars that don't card, that let 18-year-olds or 17-year-olds go in there and get wasted. I see it all the time. They don't check ID for shit. So you have all these bars that don't check IDs, and all these kids that are away from home for the first time with their parents' money to spend, on booze. And you'll, you'll see, there are a lot of people making a lot of bad decisions that, are, that feel like there are no negative repercussions. And the reason they feel like there's no negative repercussions is because, please stop trying to unplug the microphone, girl, please, please. I'll get rid of Mr. Clinton if you stop trying to unplug the microphone, girl, I promise. You'll see that there are all these consequences that, did you just put your claws in my chair? that there are all these people that believe that the only real-world consequences are that their parents will punish them. And that when their parents are gone, that there are no more negative consequences. I can do whatever I want. I can get wasted. I can cheat on tests. I can cheat on people that I'm dating. I can screw around. I can quit my internship. I can quit my job. I can fuck up while I'm working at my job. I cannot give a shit that I'm going to work drunk tomorrow. Nobody's going to care if I act like an ass for three fucking hours on the streets of Manhattan at two in the morning when I don't have anybody around me. Like, you know... That, 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 that doesn't work. You, you, don't, you shouldn't walk outside wasted at 3 in the morning with no friends or family nearby in a, in a fucked up place like Manhattan. You shouldn't do a lot of the things that these people are doing, but they do them. Because, because in their head, since their parents are no longer around, there are no more negative consequences. And that's fucked up. It's, it's, it's not, and a lot of people are going to say that, you know, I'm not disciplined, that I didn't grow up with discipline, and look at who I am. Look at this cursing idiot that's accomplished nothing for themselves. And I will concede that I like to curse. I know that this is going to show up in the comment section, so I should mention it. I like to curse, but I keep my cursing. For the most part, my cursing is something that I do on a YouTube channel, on a personal YouTube channel that I upload videos to at night that is, well, I guess now watched by 60,000 people. But in the beginning, it was watched by like 13 people. If I go to a funeral, if I go to a wake, if I go to a, you know, if, if I go to a Broadway show, you don't hear me screaming fuck at, you know, at every instance for no reason. Discipline is knowing when and when not to do these things. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm the most accomplished person in the world. I'm not the richest person in the world. I'm not the smartest person in the world by any means. But 
go through, if you go through my life history, I wanted to move out when I was 16 years old. I got a job. I worked that job for 20 to 40 hours a week in addition to going to high school. When I, decide, I figured out after a year, this is going nowhere, I'm making minimum wage, I quit that job, and I went to Manhattan, which was a terrible commute from Staten Island. One week after I quit high school, I didn't quit, I went after a week after I graduated high school, I, eh, I went to a temp agency to try to get a better paying job, and I got a job that paid twice as well. When I got fired from that crappy job, because I took sick days, I got sick, I had a 103 fever, so for two days I took off. It was a shit job at a place called 3P Delivery that provides the delivery services for Lowe's. Terrible fucking company. I don't, I don't care if they, uh, I, I, anybody who fires you because you got sick for two days when you came to work every day and did your job can fuck off. But, uh, so I don't mind mentioning the name of the company. When that happened, I decided to get an internship at a recording studio. I worked there 40 to 70 hours a week for free so that I could learn my craft and be, get better at it. Then when I got a paying job at that recording studio, I decided that I was going to get a pay, an internship at a better studio. I got an internship at Avatar. I worked there again 40 to 70 hours a week for months on end until I finally got a minimum wage position. So now I'm working at two studios full time, full time. And I'm getting paid pretty much minimum wage for my efforts. I stay there for months and months until I think that I'm good enough to start being a freelance technician at other studios. So around that, the end of that, I went to other studios that were willing to pay me good money to fix the problems with their gear at the end of... The year when the financial crisis and the financial crash came and I couldn't make much money off of doing that anymore, I realized that I have to reinvent myself. So I took my last $200 that I had in my pocket and I decided to try to turn that into a business. And I moved into a shitty little apartment in the middle of nowhere. I spent like probably a dollar a day of that on food. I was buying apples, bananas. I was refilling uh, a glass that, that I got with water. It was some like little apple juice kind of glass and I, I carried it with me everywhere and refilled it with water so that I wouldn't have to pay for water. Um, I lived a very, very structured life so that I could put all of the money that I was making back into my business. Years later, I opened a store. And after a few years, when I finally paid off everything and I, you know, the store was going well and I had employees and I didn't have to be there every day. And I decided eh, I want a new challenge. I decided a few years ago to start filming my work every single day so that other people could follow in my success. They could follow in my footsteps if they started where I did and have life just a little bit easier for them. And I've been doing that for the past two or three years. So I mean, I get it. I get it. I curse every now and then. And I may, you know, you may not agree with my opinions, but at the end of the day, do I strike you as somebody who was never punished, was never spanked, or was never disciplined as a kid? Do I strike you as somebody who has that spoiled, entitled idea that I'm going to sit on my ass and shit is just going to come to me? That's not the way I've lived my life. I've lived my life as somebody who works there 40 to 80 hours a week, who expects that anything that, that I put my mind to, I can accomplish as long as I am working my balls off at it. And all of that just came from my dad. All of that came from what he told me. It came from the stories he told me. And above all, what I really, really appreciate, above all else, is how he instilled in me this analytical thinking mindset from a young age. By always treating me like an adult, he gave me a good 10 to 15 year head start on being an adult over what most other kids had. He gave me a 10 to 15 year head start on using my brain over what most other kids had by treating me like an adult. Because again, very often you're going to get out of life and you're going to get out of people what it is you invest and what you put in. And if you're always treating the kids like a kid, you're going to get kid-like behavior out of them. But if you treat them like adults, you will often find that again, they may not be as mature as you, they may not be as knowledgeable as you, but you're going to get something better back. If you think that being a parent is about looking at the kid and going, because I say so, don't be surprised if you don't get respect. Would you respect somebody who just says, because I say so, when you ask for reasoning? Just because they're six, or eight, or ten years old does not mean that they lack reason. Does not mean that they lack knowledge. Does that mean that, that they lack a brain or a conscience or any of these things? And if you want your children to actually 
to actually respect what you have to say, you kind of have to earn that respect from them and you have to give them a reason to respect you. That's another thing that I respect about my dad is he had this belief that, you know, you should never just listen to somebody because I, you shouldn't just listen to me because I'm your dad. What I'm saying should always make sense. Uh, you should, uh, I should have to earn respect from you. Your teachers have to earn respect from you. Your bosses have to earn respect from you. Yes, you should respect them because you're younger and you don't know as much about the world as they do. But at the end of the day, I realize that if I want you to listen to me, that I need to actually say something that's worth listening to. And I need to treat you like an equal. And if I don't do that, I can't expect you to listen to me. My dad never expected, he never had an entitlement to my respect. My dad never felt entitled to have me listen to him. And as a result of always working for it, he always got it out of me. And I'm really glad that he put that work in because that work is not something that benefited him. He was putting in all that extra time and all that extra work and all that eff extra effort to earn my respect and earn authority so that I could have a better life so that I would learn how to think analytically from a very young age, so that I would learn how to analyze what the real world consequences were from my actions years before I would ever be in a situation where I have to think about those things. Again, don't bite the microphone. Don't bite the You want to be on camera, girl? Look at the camera. Look at the camera. Oh, come on, you little attention whore. Look at the camera. What, are you shy? You're afraid to put your eyes in the camera? You just want to bite the microphone, don't you? Don't you, you little... Who's my princess? Who's a good little princess? Who's my blackberry? Good girl. In the last video, somebody... Somebody brought up that I didn't pay any attention to my cat, and she was sitting there for a whole eight minutes, just all sad. What they don't see is just how much effort I put into giving her attention. Look at this constant attention. She gets constant attention every second of the day. She wakes me up at four in the morning just to get attention, even when she's not hungry. Ow, headbutt. And it's still never enough attention. Anyway, so to conclude the video, I understand that it's easy to get into this kind of dick-waving contest with other people over just how bad you had it as a kid, just how badly your parents spanked you, just how long they punished you for, how many things they took away, what they did. But at the end of the day, as cool as it is to get into that stupid pissing contest over these things and make these sweeping general statements about why the world is the way it is and why kids nowadays are the way they are, um, it's easy to project on others. It's hard to look at what you're actually doing. And are you taking the easy way out as a parent and, and, and you know, again, just taking shit away? Or are you actually trying to treat your child the way that you believe would be effective if somebody were treating you that way. Are you trying to sell your child on an idea in the same manner that would be successful if somebody else were trying to sell you on that idea? Because believe it or not, again, this isn't just about greed and money and, and business, but a lot of this is sales. You're trying to sell your kid on why they shouldn't do something stupid. You have to convince them as to why it is they shouldn't do something stupid, even when you're not around. And it, ha and it has to be a better reason other than, you know, other, other than fear, you, you know, you can't do, like, I know I link a lot of the things I talk about to the to things in business that I, I deal with, but, you know, authorized repair centers, their biggest reason, they, they don't tell you you should use them because the price is good. They don't tell you that you should use them because the turnaround is good. They don't tell you you should use them because they care about your data and they won't erase your data. No, they use fear tactics. They use, you need to use us because if you don't use us, your warranty will be voided. You don't want your warranty voided, do you? You don't want to be alone, do you? You don't want to be stuck with nobody there to help you once these other people open your stuff. There was a place a few blocks away from my work that used to say that to everybody who walked in. They went out of business a few years ago. You know why? Because nobody cares about that shit. Nobody wants to be sold based on fear. So stop selling your children based on fear of punishment. And start trying to sell your children on how they should act based on the reality of the real world. 
and have them be a part of, who, of your history, of who you are, of what made you who you are. Have them enter your world and live in your world because that's the world that they're going to be living in when they grow up and they turn 18. Not this little fantasy-ass world where you just take shit away from them every time they do something wrong and then wonder why it is when they turn 18 that they're the kids that I see while I'm on my run home that are puking in the streets, that are getting picked on by the bums, and again, you, you, you're going to have nobody to blame but yourself when this winds up being your offspring. And that's that. Unless Blackberry wants to be on camera some more. You want to be on camera, girl? Show the camera your cute face. Mwah. Yes, dig your claw straight into my knuckle. Don't put your paw there when you can put your claw there. You're going to show the camera your ass and not your face, really? You're going to moon them? This is how you expect to gain the respect of my audience. They, she just mooned you. Ow. Who's a good little girl? I wonder how she's going to react when I get her a can of food. Blackberry. Now I cease to exist because I got her food. That is cat ownership.